I read somewhere called arguably one of the best hedge fund trades of all time. So uh, I guess it went from $60 million to over $3 billion. Uh, it, was, it was a good one. <laughs> all right. <laughs> but it wasn't a trade. I wouldn't describe it as a trade. A trade is something you buy and you flip. This is something where we made the investment initially in November of 2008. Uh, and uh, we still own a company we spun off of General Growth and it's now 15 years later. So can, can you describe what went into making that decision to actually increase the value of the company? Sure. So this was at the time of the financial crisis, uh, circa November 2008. What real estate's always been a kind of sector that I've been interested in. I began my career in the real estate business working for my dad, actually, uh, arranging mortgages for real estate developers. So I, I have uh, kind of deep, deep ties and interest in the business. And General Growth was the second largest shopping mall co company in the country. Uh, Simon Properties, many people have heard of. General Growth was number two. They own some of the best malls in the country. And at that time, people thought of shopping malls as these non-disruptable things. Mm. Again, we talk about disruption. Malls have been disrupted in many ways. Uh, and General Growth stock, uh, the General Growth, the company, the CFO in particular, was very aggressive in, in the way that he borrowed money. And he borrowed money from a kind of Wall Street uh, not long-term uh, mortgages, but generally relatively short-term mortgages. It was pretty aggressive. As the value went up, he would borrow more and more against the assets, and that helped the short-term results of the business. The problem was, during the financial crisis, the the market for what's called CMBS, commercial mortgage-backed securities, basically shut. Mm -hmm. And the company, because its debt was relatively short-term, had a lot of big maturities coming up that they had no ability to refinance. And the market said, oh my God, the lenders are going to foreclose and the shareholders are going to get wiped. The company's going to go bankrupt. They're going to get wiped out. The stock went from $63 a share to $0.34. Cents. So, And the, there was a family, the Bucksbound family owned, I think, about 25% of the company. And the, they had a $5 billion, $5 billion of stock that was worth $25 million or something by the time we bought a stake in the business. And what interested me was... Uh, I thought the assets were worth substantially more than the liabilities. The company had $27 billion of debt and had a $100 million value of the equity, down from like $20 billion. <laughs> okay. And one, that, you know, sort of an interesting place to start with a stock down 99%. But the fundamental drivers of the mall business are occupancy, how occupied are the malls. Occupancy was up year on year between 07 and 08, interestingly. Net operating income, which is kind of a measure of cash flow from the malls, that was up year on year. So kind of the underlying fundamentals were doing fine. The only problem they had is they had billions of dollars of debt that they had to repay, they couldn't repay. And if you kind of examine the bankruptcy code, um, that it's precisely designed for a situation like this, where it's kind of this resting place you can go uh, to kind of re, re, uh, restructure your business. Now, the problem was that every other company that had gone bankrupt, the shareholders got wiped out. And so the market seeing every previous example, the shareholders get wiped out, the assumption is the stock's gonna go to zero. But that's not what the bankruptcy code says. What the bankruptcy, bankruptcy code says is that the value gets apportioned based on value. And if you could prove to a judge that there was the assets worth more than the liabilities, then the shareholders actually get to keep their investment in the company. Mm -hmm. And that was the bet we made. And so we stepped into the market, and we bought 25% of the co company in the open market for, we had to pay up. It started out at 34 cents. I think there were 300 million shares. So it was at a hundred million dollar value. By the time we were done, we paid an average of, we paid 60 million for 25% of the business. So about $240 million for the equity of the company. And then we had to get on the board to convince the directors the right thing to do. And the board was in complete panic, didn't know what to do, spending a ton of money on advisors. And, you know, I was a shareholder activist, you know, four years into Pershing Square, and no one had any idea what we were doing. They thought we were crazy. Every day, stock, every day we'd go into the market, we'd buy this penny stock, and we'd file what's called a 13D, every 1% increase in our stake. And people just thought we were crazy. We're buying stock in a company that's going to go bankrupt. Bill, you're going to lose all your money. Mm -hmm. You know, run. <laughs> okay. And I said, well, wait, you know, bankruptcy code says that it's more asset value than liabilities. We should be fine. And the key moment, if you're looking for uh, fun moments, is there's a woman named Maddie Buxbaum, uh, who was from the Buxbaum family. And uh, her cousin, John, was chairman of the board, CEO of the company. And 
I said, as she calls me after we disclose our stake in the company, she's like, Billy Ackman, I'm really glad to see you here. And I met her like, I don't think it was a date, but I kind of met her in a social context when I was like 25 or something. And she said, look, I'm really glad to see you here. And if there's anything I can do to help you, call me. I said, sure. Uh, we kept trying to get on the board of the company. They wouldn't invite us on. Couldn't really run a proxy contest, that, you know, not with a company going bankrupt. And their advisors actually were Goldman Sachs. And they're like, you don't want the fox in the hen house. Mm -hmm. And they were listening to their advisors. So I called Maddie up and I said, Maddie, I need to get on the board of the company to help. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know what? I will call my cousin and I'll get it done. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, she calls back a few hours later, you'll be going on to the board. I don't know what she said to, <laughs> to her cousin. <laughs> well, she was convincing. Next thing you know, I'm invited to on the board of the company. And the board is talking about at the old equity of general growth. Old equity is what you talk about, the shareholders are getting wiped out. I said, no, 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 this board represents the current equity of the company. Mm -hmm. And I'm a major shareholder, John's a major shareholder. There's plenty of asset value here. This company should be able to restru be restructured for the benefit of shareholders. And we led a restructuring for the benefit of shareholders. And it took, let's say uh, eight months and the company emerged from chapter 11. We made an incremental investment into the company. And the shareholders kept the vast majority of their investment. Uh, all the creditors got their, you know, face amount of their investment, par plus accrued, accrued interest. And it was a great outcome. All the employees kept their jobs. The mall stayed open. There was no liquidation. It, the bankruptcy system worked the way it should. Uh, you know, I was in court, you know, all the time. And the first uh, meeting with the judge, the judge was like, look, this would never have happened were it not for a financial crisis. And once the judge said, I knew we were going to be fine because the company had really not done anything fundamentally wrong, maybe a little too aggressive in how they borrowed money. And uh, stock went from 34 cents to $31 a share. And actually, fun little anecdote, um, we made a lot of people a lot of money who followed us into it. Uh, I got a lot of nice thank you notes, which you get on occasion in this business, believe it or not. And then one day I get a voicemail. This is when there was something called voicemail, mm -hmm. probably a few years later. And it's a guy with a very thick Jamaican accent leaving a message for Bill Ackman. So, you know, I return all my calls, call the guy back. He's like, hi, it's Bill Ackman. I'm just returning your call. And he's like, oh, Mr. Ackman, uh, thank you so much for calling me. And I said, oh, how can I help? He says, I wanted to thank you. I said, what do you mean? He said, I saw you on CNBC, you know, a couple of years ago, and you were talking about this general growth and the stock. I said, where was the stock at the time? He said, it's 60 cents or something like this. I said, and I bought a lot of stock. And I'm like, well, how much did you invest? Oh, I invest all of my money <laughs> in the company. And he was a New York City taxi driver and he invested like $50,000 or something like this at 60 cents a share. And he was still holding it and he went into retirement and he made, you know, 50 times his money. And, uh, you know, those are the moments that you feel pretty good about investing. What gave you confidence through that? Went to penny stock and I'm sure you were getting a lot of naysayers and people saying that this is crazy. It's the same thing. You just do the work. Like we got a lot of pushback from our investors actually, because we had never invested in a bankrupt company uh, before. It's a field called distressed investing and they're dedicated uh, distressed investors. And we weren't considered one of them. So Bill, what are you doing? You don't know anything about distressed investing. You don't know anything about bankruptcy investing. Um, but I can read. I can and you learned. And I learned. And it sometimes it's very helpful not to be a practitioner, an expert in something, because you get used to the conventional wisdom. And so we just, you know, abstractly read the uh, step back and look at the facts. And, and it was just a really interesting setup for uh, one of the best investments we ever made. How hard is it to learn some of the legal aspects of this? Like you mentioned bankruptcy code. Like I imagine it's very sort of dense language and dense ideas and the loopholes and all that kind of stuff. Like if you're just stepping in and you've never done distressed investing, how hard is it to figure out? It's not that hard. No, it's not that hard. Okay. I mean, I literally read a book on distressed investing. Okay. Ben Branch or something, something on distressed investing. So you were able to pick up the intuition from that, just all the, uh, the basic skills involved, the basic facts to know, all that kind of stuff. Most of the world's knowledge has already been written somewhere. You just got to read the right books. And uh, also had great lawyers, uh, you know, built up some great relationships. We we work with Sullivan and Cromwell 
and uh, their lawyer there named Joe Shanker, who I met earlier in my career. Pershing Square is actually my second act in the hedge fund business. I started a fund called Gotham Partners when I was 26. One of my early investments was a company called Rockefeller Center Properties that was heading for bankruptcy. And uh, the lawyer on the other side representing Goldman Sachs was a guy named Joe Schenker. So he was like an obvious phone call because we had yet another real estate bankruptcy. And that one, we did, we did very well, but I missed the big opportunity. And uh, I, I, I suffered severe psychological torture every time I walked by Rockefeller Center because we could have made, we knew more about that property than anyone else, but I knew less about deal making and didn't have the resources. And I was 28 years old or 27. Um, and they hired a better lawyer than we did. And uh, they outsmarted us on that one in a way. So I said, okay, I'm going to go hire this guy the next time around. <laughs> so, uh, 